right. That's the uh, stock song I get in my streaming thing here. I use what's called StreamYard. That's kind of that's kind of cool, huh? All right, hi everybody. Welcome to a Tuesday edition of the live stream here. Before we bring Justin on, let's do a little bit of admin. So first off, I uh, want to mention that friend of the channel, John Nickel, you guys may remember he was the tornado RAF aviator who was shot down during Desert Storm. He described his uh, captivity on an episode some months ago. His book was just sent to me by his publisher. It isn't out yet. It's coming out on May 23rd. So what is that? That's like six days away and at that time we'll have him on the channel and this is basically the history of ejections which you may know were invented by the uh the brits so i'm looking forward to reading this one so more to follow on this also tickets for mucha palooza have just gone on sale this is our signature live event every year. I've done a few across the country, but the one here in Annapolis is particularly uh, fun and, and uh, it's our biggest one. So tickets are on sale. There is a limited number and they're already selling pretty briskly. So if you're interested in joining us on July 15th here in Annapolis, uh, we'd love to see you here. Um, we did it at Metropolitan last year. And it was really a lot of fun. I also mentioned that uh, there'll be a showcase by my new band, Danger Boy, um, which I'm very excited about. And uh, so you can check us out if you show up. All right. As I said, the link for ticket purchases is in the episode description. You can see I'm wearing my Marshall T-shirt. This is in honor of our British guest. Marshall is a British company, although they were acquired by a Swedish company. And, and folks are often asking, hey, Mooch, well, you know, talk to us about the gear in the background. So all of the guitars here are American made. And we'll just run through them real quick. So Les Paul Standard, Les Paul Jr. The acoustic in the back there is a Taylor Rickenbacker here and then my latest acquisition is this badass jackson soloist which i just had set up by our local luthier here but my amplifier my signature amplifier i do have a fender <clears throat> amp here a, a blues junior but um this marshall is is my go-to so that's a british company love marshall so without any oh also let me also point out that Sailor the Wonder Dog is is crashed out on the couch behind me. She is a German wire-haired pointer. We're about to start dock diving season. She loves to do dock diving. In fact, she uh, posted a record for herself last year, last summer at 20 feet. Um, so we're looking forward to that, that right of summer, which is uh, dock diving. So let's bring Justin on. Hello, my friend. How are you? Hey, uh, I'm all right. Uh, although I will say, just as a, an apology up front, if I start hacking my guts out at some point uh, during the stream, uh, I apologize in advance. I've been trying to shake a chest infection for the past week or so. Uh, should be all right, but uh, just uh, apologies in advance if I start okay. coughing. Okay, noted, noted. The mute button exists for a reason. I'll, I'll, if you start hacking, I'll go grab a guitar and I'll just do a little interlude here. Um, also, let's point out that you are going, you're, you're giving a lot to us today because it's your wife's birthday. So happy birthday, Mel. Um, I will mention that as I've done before, I gooned up the time between British summertime and Eastern daylight time. It is five hours. And so uh, Justin mentioned a couple of days ago, because he is the busiest man on the planet, but he mentioned that he was available today at 1600 
British summertime. And so I'm going, oh, okay. I feel like the guys in Spinal Tap. What is that, 50 hours, 150 hours, right? Um, it's 11 o'clock my time. So you ping me at 11. I'm like, yeah, uh, okay. He, he's like, I don't have the, the link to come up the live stream. I'm like, okay, you know, relax. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, geez. So we figured out, let's just Delta one plus zero, zero, or actually 55 minutes. So here we are. So let's review the bidding a little bit, Justin, of our recent uh, chats. We had you on a few weeks ago talking about basically the UK, Italian, Japanese, Japan partnership for six gen. And you wrote a, an item at Rusi, which said, look, either fund it or let's seriously focus on unmanned uh, UCAVs. And, and that was a great episode. I entreat folks, if you haven't seen that conversation, check it out. As with all of our live streams, once we're done with the live part, it becomes an episode on the channel. So check that out. But then more recently, I did an episode a couple of days ago, actually on Sunday, that I titled, Is This the Ukrainian Counteroffensive? Where I was sort of lashing up a couple of different current events elements. One was the actual counteroffensive going on around Bakhmut to the west and northwest. The other was the basic mutiny of the head of Wagner Group, uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, and his looks like he's kind of having a parting of the ways with Putin particularly, and what that indicates in terms of morale at the highest levels and dissension and that sort of thing. And then the last thing that I added to that was the fact that the UK had gifted the Storm Shadow missile to Ukraine. And uh, Ben Wallace, the Minister of Defense, said, yeah, we, we do this with, with, you know, consciously and with open eyes about the fact we're trying to counter the Russian threat against the civilian population. So the last bit of current information, current events associated with this is a couple of days ago, there was a cruise missile attack on an area around Kiev. The Russians claimed that they were going after a Patriot missile battery. But in counter to that, President Zelensky had this to say. All missiles were shut down, including ballistic ones. So not sure what is the truth, but after seeing a tweet or a retweet that you had a couple of days ago that tees up an item written by your colleague, and let me bring it up here, Jack Watling, titled Putting Russia's Army in the Shadow of the Storm. I wanted to chat with you, and let me start by reading his opening paragraph here, here. So Jack writes, the decision by the UK government to gift Storm Shadow cruise missiles to Ukraine prov provides a significant capability for disrupting Russian logistics and command and control that will likely prove useful in support of forthcoming Ukrainian offensive operations. At more than 790,000 pounds ammunition, that's currency not weighed, however, they will have to be expended carefully. So let me also put up a graphic here about the range of Storm Shadow. And as I mentioned in my, is this the counteroffensive episode from a couple of days ago, the Ukrainians gave MOD Secretary Wallace assurances that they would not use this missile against sovereign Russia. They did, however, say we reserve the right to use it against Ukrainian held or Russian held Ukrainian territory. So that's the Donbass and even Crimea. So the war comes down to two, and this is a 
grossly facile matrix. It comes down to two things, offensive and defensive. So you and I are usually talking about offensive. That's like, what airplane should they get? Should they get vegan? Should they get F-16. Hopefully, hopefully not vegans. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever airplane we're going to, you know, dance angels on the head of a pin around, yeah. which is what we love to do. And we'll sort of look at the missiles on airplanes of Russian uh, assets as they're taxing and make a whole episode out of that. We'll talk about the fact that we've kind of hardwired harm missiles onto MiG-29s. And is that an effective CAD, DAD strategy, these kinds of things. But I want to focus a little bit on, let's call it, call it the counter civilian Russian strategy. So this is both ground launched and air launched. So my basic question to you, Muchi award winning Dr. Justin Bronk, is is the Patriot an effective weapon against this threat? That's the first question. Yeah. Uh, so the one thing to, to kind of start with up front is that the uh, Russian long range aviation, so LRA, uh, which is essentially their strategic bombers. Uh, so their Tupolev 95s, the Bears, Tupolev 160s, the Blackjacks, which look like a, a larger white version of the B1, um, and their Tu 22 M3s, which are the, the, the Blackfires, um, alongside their MiG 31. Uh, BMs, which are interceptors, and then MiG-31K or Is, which launch these uh, Kinshal uh, aeroballistic missiles, have been one of the most effective, reliable bits of the Russian military throughout this war. Um, the LRA uh, bombers have consistently uh, met their launch um, you know, requirements. They've consistently fulfilled their missions with a high rate of success. They have enough spare capacity that they uh, continually generate in terms of you know on non not required aircraft that are there as spares um with spare missiles that they they tend to even if there are um technical issues with some of them during a, a sortie they tend to launch um what they are ordered to launch and do so um effectively in terms of accuracy at the terminal end with those um crews and, and aerial or aeroballistic missiles so this is one of the most consistently capable bits of the Russian military in the war so far. And of course, it's used alongside the ground launched. Uh, so Iskander M uh, launcher, which fires uh, the 9M720 and 9M723, which are ballistic missiles um, from which the Kinshal aero ballistic missile is, is largely derived. Um, and also the, the Iskander can also launch, M can also launch the, I think it's 9M728, which is an advanced cruise missile. So when people say Iskander ballistic missiles, that, that's actually wrong. The, the Iskander is the launcher, the missiles are, uh, and, and the launcher can fire both ballistic and cruise missiles. And then also you've got the Navy, the Russian Navy launching um, Calibir and other uh, sea launch cruise missiles, both from surface platforms uh, and from submarines. So Ukraine has consistently um, been fighting a two-tiered air defense battle um, throughout the war. They've been, on the one hand, and we've touched on this quite a lot in previous conversations, been fighting a, a you know, very successful campaign so far with their tactical um, SAM systems, their, their book, uh, SA-11, OSA, SA-8, um, with their tactical SAMs to keep the Russian aerospace forces, fast jets and attack aviation away from the front lines and unable to effectively um, you know, uh, control the flow of, of battle that way. And then the second aspect has been this, this deep defense task, which has primarily been um, conducted with long range assets. So S300, PS and PT, which we would term SA-10 in NATO, uh, and the more advanced um, tracked uh, S300 V1, which we would term SA-12. Um, they have been kind of the cornerstones of Ukraine's counter cruise missile and uh, with SA-12 counter ballistic missile to some degree um, capacity. And Patriot is really a reinforcement for, for that bit of the, the air defense game in the same way that NASAMS and Iris TSLM uh, are, are more in the class of something like Book um, SA-11. So Patriot is a, a significant in, uh, step up in terms of the 
complexity, the value in terms of monetary value, uh, and the range, the effective range and target type coverage that uh, air defense equipment supplied by the West to Ukraine can can cover. Uh, it's a system that's hugely in demand around the world. Uh, the US doesn't have enough for its own requirements vis-a-vis uh, -vis, vis -vis China uh, in the Indo-Pacific. It uh, Obviously, also the US has significant production uh, obligations to overseas customers, particularly Taiwan, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Israel. Uh, notably, Saudi Arabia and UAE are under regular, um, relatively high-end ballistic missile attack from Iran and Iranian proxies. So um, you know, they, they have a significant ammunition expenditure um, replacement requirement. So it, it's, a, it's a system for which there's quite a lot of capacity um, in terms of, unlike most SAM systems, the West does have quite a lot of them relatively speaking, but it's also a system that's in huge demand. Um, and so it will be difficult to get the Ukrainians vast amounts of ammunition um, to continue expending uh, as they would like to. So it's something that will have to be prioritized by the Ukrainians to defend key assets. Um, on the other hand, uh, and, and very you know, excellent to see, it has proven extremely effective so far in the initial um, interceptions that it's been conducting. Uh, and crucially, it is clearly protecting those uh, key cities, um, power installations, and other sort of key military assets. So you know, a, a, a very important capability. Uh, not necessarily so much for civilian defense per se, although, of course, a lot of these key targets are located in civilian health, in, in, in cities or around cities. And so it will certainly help protecting civilians. Um, but uh, you know the, the the sort of strategic big picture thing for for Patriot is to provide Ukraine with a means to provide a significant, although by no means perfect, degree of protection around critical infrastructure and military sort of nodes from those ballistic and aero ballistic missiles that, until recently, Russia has been able to launch with relatively little chance of interception. So, the. As we look at this as a system of systems or the entire fighting of the war as a system of systems, because again, as I said at the outset, sometimes we get sort of myopic, let's just call it myopic about the fighter they should have. Or the other question, uh, discussion we've had is the offensive artillery capability, right? So for instance, you know, high Mars was the thing, right? If, I, if we only had high Mars, uh, we could hold them at arm's length in an effective way and be able to stymie the advance. And that's like, okay, high Mars is okay, but now we need a TACMs. And so it seemed like that was the same conversation around Patriot. Like we have the SAMs that you outlined but we need Patriot because it's, you know, longer range defense, more accurate, so forth and so on. Also mentioned that, that President Zelensky just finished a tour, another visit to the UK. Um, and uh, I'm not sure what his ask was on this one. I'm sure it had to deal with, uh, with the, the fighters that they want. But it seems like it's always this, if, if we only had this, then that would completely tip the balance and we'd be good to go. So it's like, if we, I, I thank you, Slovakia and Poland for the MiG 29As. But if we only had F 16s, then dot, 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 right? So I, I just, I think every once in a while we've got to kind of pull up to 30,000 feet and look at the gifting in toto and then sort of assess whether what they've got equals what they need to affect victory, not to mention a counteroffensive in any meaningful way. Because as I mentioned in my last episode about the counteroffensive, President Zelensky's statement is, hey, if we could do it now, but we'd lose a lot of people, so I'm not going to do it now until I get the thing I need. So it's like, okay, what is that? So again, my question is, Patriot is a very effective system. It's proven that over its history. In fact, in some cases, too effective because there's been some dubious circumstances of fratricide um, by the Americans, particularly. Um, but it, it works. And 
what President Zelensky is stating and what the visuals we're seeing is it worked a couple of days ago. In fact, they had this infographic of all the things they shot down that day. And I know you also commented on a tweet about the four SAM kills of various Russian type model series that occurred a couple of days ago. So you look at these things you're like, wow, again, we only see one side of the equation, particularly on Twitter or whatever, but it looks like the stuff we're giving them is working pretty good. So do we have inventory issues? And the other question is like our first conversation was the issue with the Russian military is in that case, it was PGM inventory. Do they have cruise missile inventory shortages that, that could stymie their ability to wage this counter civilian campaign? Yeah, this is a lot in the question. Um, so starting off with the, uh, with the, the, the kind of continual asks, um, for for support of the, at each stage, um, high Mars to begin with uh, was you know, absolutely critical and you know genuinely game changing. I think that term is massively overused, but genuinely game changing when it was supplied in late summer last year. Uh, at that at the point where high Mars was was supplied and supplied with sufficient ammunition to be used effectively. Uh, the Ukrainian armed forces were having an extremely difficult time against the, the Russians in Donbass. Casualty rates were very high and the Russians were essentially just grinding down one position after another with massed fire. Um, the ability, but the, what HIMARS did was give the Ukrainians the ability to smash any relatively static target within about 70 kilometers of the front. And that was crucial for forcing the Russians to disperse their um, ammunition stockpiles. So what they've been doing is bringing in, you know, they were firing 30 to 60,000 shells a day. Um, they were bringing those in, you know, it's a huge volume of material. They were bringing those in via um, railways and particularly sort of spur lines close to the guns and then piling up this huge, these huge amounts of ammunition near the gun lines. And so the guns could reposition if they needed to for counter battery reasons, but the ammunition couldn't. Uh, and the, the ability to kind of mass ammo close to the guns like that in a relatively static form was crucial to that Russian strategy, and it was really hurting the Ukrainians. HIMARS over the coming month, over the following months, has essentially forced the Russian army to significantly disperse its ammunition uh, depots, its logistics depots, and its command and control, and most of all, to move them back. So a lot of those key assets are now outside the range of HIMARS. Furthermore, the Russians have got better at um, jamming and denying or degrading um, the, the GPS and, and other elements of the HIMARS system to reduce its accuracy in, in a lot of areas. But essentially, it's still an effective system, but the Russian army has had time to adapt and over six, seven months, it's no longer providing that level of um, disruption to Russian army capabilities, especially the capability to respond rapidly to Ukrainian movements, i.e. around a counteroffensive. What Storm Shadow does is it gives the Ukrainians uh, the capability to once again threaten key static targets or, of high value targets, such as command and control centers, key communications nodes, ammunition storage, key depots, all of that kind of stuff significantly beyond the range of HIMARS. And therefore, it's about dislocating the Russian army's support, command, and, and logistics posture again. Um, and one of the key determinants of, of how effective or not uh, the Ukrainian counteroffensives are likely to be is going to be how quickly the Russian army can cohere and maneuver large-scale forces and enablers to concentrate on sort of stemming any breakthrough that the Ukrainians make from elsewhere in the front. That requires functioning logistics and command and control um, facilities within relatively good reach of the front. And so Heimar, Storm Shadow not only gives the Ukrainians the ability to hit some facilities, there, there will be a limited number, as, as Jack's article points out, you know, there are these are systems that are expensive, they're strategic systems, we don't have a huge number of them to give. And so they won't be able to destroy all targets, but they will be able to destroy some key targets. And the fact that they are there means the Russians will have to significantly disperse and, and move further back 
um, you know, a lot of their, their military infrastructure, and that will introduce further inefficiency and delay into their operations, which is really key. Um, it's, you know, one of the reasons Storm Shadow can be integrated is because like a lot of cruise missiles, it's a very smart weapon, but it 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 is programmed generally before it's launched, and so before the aircraft is 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 takes off, and so a that provides some degree of likely oversight um, in terms of what targets are selected, um, because there'll probably be some assistance on that. It's a complex system, um, but also crucially, it, it's easier to effectively mount on things like a Sukhoi twenty four, probably the launch platform based on on the weight of that of that missile and the, and the size of it. Um, without having to get the missile to interact directly with the aircraft's own systems, which is very difficult. So it, it's, you know, you can, one can see fairly logically how it will have been integrated and why it will be effective, even though it's being launched from aircraft that it wasn't designed for. Um, in terms of the, the Ukrainian asks continuing though, I mean, it, of course they are. They're fighting an existential war of national survival to try and liberate territory they've they're, they're losing tens of thousands of people of course they're asking for everything they possibly think they can get we would be doing exactly the same in their position one thing that's interesting though is to, to, to kind of think about is different parts of the ukrainian system will inevitably see the requirements in different ways so for example if you are a, a senior ukrainian commander you might have a different view on the prioritization that Western support capacity, which is finite, uh, should be allocated to than if you were, you know, the Ukrainian naval personnel, you, you might want some more naval um, orientated support to be higher priority or a Ukrainian fighter pilot. Of course, for you, you know, flying outdated aircraft against heavy odds, you will want replacement Western aircraft as the number one immediate priority yesterday. Um, but you know th there will be a difference in perspective depending on which part of the system you ask and which which sort of layer of the war they're looking at tactical operational strategic etc and from what service background or political background so the ukrainian system doesn't speak with one voice either so when you see things like the you know the us stating that you know fighters are the seventh or eighth priority in 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 line for for ukrainian support requirements at the moment that can be entirely true based on what they're being told and also entirely false and misleading from the perspective of someone much closer to the Ukrainian Air Force front line, let's say. Um, so, you know, we, we should understand that just as our own countries and militaries don't speak with one voice, even when they're supposed to, um, the Ukrainians don't either. And that's not because they're trying to be duplicitous or anything like that. It's just it's an entire country fighting a war in a relatively siloed system. Um, so yeah, the, the continued asks, of course, but so would we. Um, and you know, if you look at the UK uh, in the Second World War, for example, with Lend Lease, um, despite being, uh, you know, at, at, at that point in the war, arguably the, the preeminent military power in the world, um, certainly in the air and on and at sea, uh, you know, we the asks to the US just kept coming. You know, first it was destroyers to help, you know, pre help escort the Arctic convoys. It was engines to your know, engine manufacturer to help with our own aircraft. Then it was off the shelf aircraft. It was oil. It was fuel. You know, of course you ask for what you can get because you're in an existential war. And so every time you make a breakthrough, um, you move on to the next priority to try and get support there. Um, and yeah, it, I don't, don't, I don't for a second buy that. You know, sometimes you see arguments, sometimes made in bad faith, sometimes made in good faith, but that the Ukrainians are sort of playing games around this. No, they're just trying to do their best to get the equipment they feel they need to win the war that they're fighting. Um, yeah. So your perspective is always appreciated. Uh, we will continue to focus on this war as long as it is going on, as we have from the beginning. So, Justin, again, thank you for spending some time with us today on your wife's birthday. Again, tell her happy birthday for us. And we look forward to having you on the channel again soon. Until then, safe travels to you. Thanks, Mitch. Speak soon. All right. That'll do it for this live stream. Thanks to everybody for showing up on a Tuesday. Good crowd as usual. And as always, once we're signed off here, this will become an episode of the channel. So not only can you review the question, I'm sorry, the comment stream, which has been lively. Thank you, guys. You can also add comments uh, to the episode uh, at that time. So as always, subscribe, like,
comment as you have. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the super thanks or become a patron at patreon.com slash Ward Carroll. Don't forget the Mooch Report newsletter comes out every Tuesday. Link is in the episode description. It's free and chock full of all kinds of information. And in the meantime, as always, I look forward to talking to you again very soon.